Hello and welcome to the webinar Visions of the Future, organized by the Energy Transition Initiative at NTNU, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. My name is Ruth Astrid Seta and I've been given the honor to guide us through the next two hours where we will look into the crystal ball from different angles. What can we expect when it comes to the necessary transition of our energy systems? This is the fourth webinar in the series of five, replacing the physical energy transition conference, which was supposed to take place in Trondheim in March this year. And just to put this webinar in its right context, a few words about the previous ones. In the first webinar, we heard of a world in crisis. We are nowhere near reaching the goals in the Paris Agreement. The topic of the second webinar was that fossil energy will still constitute a major portion of the global energy mix for many years to come. Technological breakthroughs such as CCS are urgently needed alongside both an increase in renewable energy production and more energy efficient solutions in order to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. Now, in the third webinar, we were introduced to some game changes that might accelerate the necessary developments in the energy transition within finance, digital technology and civil society. And today, dear friends, it is time to look ahead. The organizers have invited four speakers representing different sectors and stakeholders to give us their visions of the future. And in addition to them, we also have a couple of specialists with us here today, and they are here to challenge our four speakers during the panel discussion at the end of this webinar. And of course, all of you in the audience are invited to participate by commenting and asking questions too. And the way to do that is through our interactive platform, and I encourage you now to do the following. So open a browser either on your computer, your tablet or your smartphone and type slido.com. You can see it on the screen here. Today's event code is, logically enough, ET Visions Future. Uh, now you're entering a forum where you can ask questions and comments. And the most important feature within Slido is the like button. It's not a popularity contest, it's just to enhance the relevance of the questions. If you see, for instance, that someone has already written down a question that resembles slightly or even a lot the question that you had in mind, instead of writing it down, just click like on the one that is already there. That is going to save you the time to write and it helps me out seeing what is relevant and not having to read several versions of more or less the same question or argument. And if you wish to do so, you can also name the recipient of the question or just mark it debate or discussion. And you don't have to, to write your own name there if you don't want to. You may be anonymous. I am going to do my very best to convey the questions to the speakers, although I cannot guarantee that every question will be asked because that all depends on you and how active you are. Now, there's going to be a short Q&A session behind every presentation and also the panel discussion. You may participate in both. If you didn't catch the URL for Slido, it's still there though. I'm going to repeat it and I think it's going to be put into the chat at your GoToWebinar platform so you can just watch it there as well as we go along. And the chat is not an active chat. You can ask questions of technical characters, but if you have questions for the speakers, please use Slido. And don't be shy, do participate. Now, it is time to get started with the programme itself. And who better to do that than Edgar Hertig? He is professor at the Department of Energy and Process Engineering at NTNU and International Chair in Industrial Ecology, that is also at NTNU. His CV is pretty substantial, so it would take too long for me to give you the full picture. Besides, it's much more interesting listening to him directly. However, I would like to mention that he was one of the leading authors of the fifth IPCC assessment report and he currently leads the work on resource efficiency and climate change of the International Resource Panel. It should come as no surprise though, uh, or then, that resources and the materials efficiency and circular economy are important keywords for him. 
And I know that we're going to hear more about that now as I'm going to leave the digital screen to him. But I also hope that he will start by reminding us of why we are here now at this webinar today under the umbrella of the energy transition. So, Edgar Hertwich, the digital scene and screen, they are both yours. Take it away. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to talk about visions for the future uh, with respect to carbon and carbon dioxide emissions related to energy and materials. Now, why are we interested in uh, carbon? Um, well, on the one hand, carbon provides us with about 80% of the energy that we use on the planet in the form of fossil fuels. On the other hand, the, uh, carbon dioxide is responsible for about three quarters of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which contribute to warming uh, the planet. Uh, since the beginning of the industrial revolu revolutions, the average global temperature has increased by about one degree centigrade. World leaders have decided uh, in Paris uh, that they would like to uh, limit the temperature rise to well below two degrees centigrade, which is often meant to understood to mean uh, 1.5 degrees. Uh, now, uh, in this figure here, you see two different options to achieve such a limit. We can either uh, reduce uh, CO2 emissions to close to zero within this decade, or uh, we can take a little bit longer time uh, increasing the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere beyond uh, the limit that would mean uh, reaching 1.5 degree, and then backpedaling, uh, removing uh, CO2 from the atmosphere for the rest of the century. This is a very expensive proposition. In either case, emissions need to be reduced quite drastically. Uh, why am I interested in materials? Well, in addition uh, to energy, uh, in addition to being an energy intensive in industry, material production also has process emissions of CO2, for example, in the reduction of steel uh, or the production of clinker. Uh, Greenhouse gas emissions from materials production have increased faster than greenhouse gas emissions from energy production, uh, going from 5 billion tons in 1995 to 11.5 billion tons in 2015. The most important materials in terms of their greenhouse gas emissions are iron and steel and other metals, cement and other uh, non-metallic minerals, and plastics and rubber. Uh, now, uh, there are options to technologically reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, from uh, these production processes. Uh, just two weeks ago, uh, the Swedish Prime Minister opened a pilot facility uh, for the production of steel using hydrogen as a reductant, thus eliminating uh, CO2 uh, from this process. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the company that is the pioneer in the field, hybrid in Sweden, estimates that they will take another 15 years of development before they can commercialize this technology. Uh, during those 15 years, uh, a lot of emissions would be released to the atmosphere from the further production of steel. Uh, also for other materials, uh, there's a lot of facilities that are currently in operation uh, that will remain in operation uh, and whose average uh, life is for the next uh, 25 years. Uh, so we expect that emissions from materials production will remain to be high. Our most prospect, uh, best chance for reducing emissions related to materials actually comes at the material demand side, 
we need to dematerialize the economy, looking at material efficiency opportunities. Uh, we have uh, led a study uh, by the International Resource Panel, uh, which investigates options for material efficiencies uh, within the residential building sector and uh, the private uh, passenger transport sector. Now, we have looked at uh, seven important material efficiency strategies at different parts of the life cycle of these products. We have looked at uh, designing products using less materials uh, to provide the product, at using uh, emission uh, materials that have less greenhouse gas emissions um, per unit function than the materials that are currently used, for example, using wood as a construction material, at improving the yields during manufacturing processes, thus eliminating manufacturing waste. We've looked at providing more service from the same product, uh, thus requiring fewer products to provide the same service level. Uh, we have looked at the issue of product lifetime extension, also increasing the amount of services delivered from the same product. We've investigated the recovery, remanufacturing, and reuse of components from these products, as well as uh, the uh, recycling of the materials at the end of life of the products. Uh, now, this is for residential buildings in the G7 countries. We can see that in 2016, uh, there's a lot of emissions from the energy use in buildings, but there's also a substantial amount of emissions uh, from producing those buildings. Uh, as the energy efficiency of buildings increases and the energy supply is decarbonized, in the future we expect that the greenhouse gas emissions associated uh, with energy use in buildings goes down um, and that there are uh, relative importance of materials actually increases if nothing is done about it. However, if we employ all the different material efficiency strategies that we have investigated in our study, uh, what we actually see that um, it's not only that the emissions from the materials can be almost eliminated, uh, but also that emissions uh, related to energy consumption uh, are further reduced. And this is mostly related to the strategy of more intensive use, which has the largest potential. By having to heat or cool less building space, uh, we save materials for constructing the building space, but also uh, for uh, the operational uh, of the buildings. In addition, uh, there are options through material substitution, uh, through enhanced uh, recycling uh, to further reduce those emissions. Similar strategies also apply uh, within the cars sector. Uh, so we can uh, use uh, cars more intensively by ride sharing, by car sharing. We can reduce the average size of the vehicles on the street um, by sharing vehicles so that we have smaller uh, on, and trip appropriate vehicles available um, for our uses. And there are further opportunities related to the substitution of materials. Uh, so my vision for the future is uh, that we will use um, largely uh, multifamily wooden buildings that are built as net zero energy buildings um, that have shared facilities, um, that we will uh, employ shared vehicles of various sizes, and uh, that we will slowly move towards uh, low emissions technologies in material production in the 1930s and from there on. Um, now you might have checked <laughs> that who would want this future? Uh, and what I see is that a lot of this is happening already. Today in Trondheim, where this picture was taken, uh, the prices for new flats um, in uh, multifamily residences have gone up uh, and are higher than the prices for individual homes. 
Thank you. No, thank you very much, Edgar. That was a, it was a bit shorter at the end there. I think you didn't get the chance to say thank you because I know um, you probably would have, but you are with us now uh, for a short Q&A session. So you can just turn your camera on and also your microphone. There you are. Hi again, and thank you so much for a very interesting uh, start and presentation. Um, you said it yourself, it's an ongoing trend with people living in smaller and more compact flats and sharing different kinds of services. Uh, but I was just wondering, how realistic is it that the majority of us want to live that way in the future? Well, <laughs> That's a good question. So I'm a little bit concerned about the fallout from the COVID crisis. Uh, before yeah. that, urban living was definitely on the rise, and you you could see it on the re in the real estate market, right? The the more urban, the more central uh, a flat was, the faster the the prices were going up, um, and we could see that around the whole world. But what we are observing now is that um, because of the social distancing, uh, people actually you know, and the and the home working people don't care so much about the city centers, and they have bought the latte machines themselves, and uh, and 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 so that's my concern is that there will be an expansion of living space in the industrialized countries given uh, the potential change of working conditions. But I'm still wondering. I mean, we had this what is called in in geographically uh, agglomeration economies. That means that. Um, people create value by interacting with each other and urban cities would offer that right urban space because you know in the partnership both of the partners would find a good job and um, and just talk to the right people and have these social interactions um, that would offer creativity and new solutions. And that was basically the explanation for, for a lot of the economic growth in the past decade. Um, and, and such conditions are, of course, furthered by having people in proximity. So my question now with COVID is, can we recreate this in a situation where we also have some degree of social distancing? So maybe instead of all ac accumulating in Oslo or, or Manhattan, maybe we, sh we should have centers that are spread out through the country that are not in the millions, but in, in the hundreds of thousands. Um, where you still have have sort of an, an urban living, but you, you, you sort of create distance at the same time. And of course, the picture I showed you intentionally wasn't a high-rise tower, but it was still something that, that has, has sort of four, four or five stories. So uh, we actually find in our modeling that these moderately sized multifamily homes are much more resource efficient than the uh, 30 uh, story towers that China likes to build, right? Um, and so actually resource efficiency isn't this inhumane um, hundreds, uh, tens of millions um, uh, of cities. People factories in a way, oh, that's what I like to call yeah. them. If they but but I'm I'm just thinking when you're talking now you, you do mention China as one example but I get the sense that what you're talking about is applicable for industrialized countries but what about the developing countries I mean they are you know rising to right. uh, well, from poverty and into um, well I shouldn't say wealth but a better standard of living but how can you um, I, I'm, and I I do suspect that a lot of them do feel that they have a pretty intensive use of the space they yes. have available already. So to who is this actually applicable? Well, it is actually some of the more technical strategies of you know, building lighter buildings and using wood as a construction material uh, that are more applicable in developing countries because there's more need for new building space that needs to be built. Um, at the same time, of course, you mentioned, you know, I mentioned China and you reacted to it. China now has more living space per capita than the UK does. <laughs> and it's, it's mostly uh, oh. reinforced concrete oh. and glass. Uh, actually, China is using more than half of the glass in the world within its construction sector. 
Um, and, and so you can see how these formerly developing countries now have a, a bypassing us. Um, and of course, we can't have a repeat of China's development model in India or in sub-Saharan Africa. That would be a catastrophe for the world. Um, at the same time, we, we, we see that there is a substantial need for better living standards. And that will uh, mean that there need to be emissions to produce all the buildings and the vehicles that these people actually um, require for decent living. And we, we need to reduce our emissions to make space for that. Edgar, uh, we have to move along into the program, but um, I have yes. received a couple of questions from the audience and I want you to, to pick them up now, not answer them, but keep them for the panel discussion later on because you will be participating in that. So the first one is, could you also give some insight on viability with respect to circular carbon economy? So you can ponder mm -hmm. upon that. And another one is easier to reply to, I think, as it's more or less a yes or no question. Wouldn't it be increasing the deforestation rate if we encourage wooden buildings? Uh, you can you can ponder on that as well. Oh, things are popping in now. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm actually going to save a couple of these questions for later because they're really good sure. for the discussion. So thank you so far, Edgar. We're going to see you again later on. And people continue to ask questions through Slido. That is perfect. I'm going to keep these questions as uh, I see them right now. So uh, you can absent yourself for, for now, Edgar, and we're going to see you later on. Thank you so much. And let's now twist our crystal ball a little bit and look at the future from another angle, more precisely from the angle of Europe's largest producer of renewable energy, Slavkraft. This is a Norwegian company built on hydropower, now present in many countries around the world and still with renewable energy production at its core. The future decides, they say at Slavkraft, and just some days ago they published this year's update for their low emission scenario for 2050. What that scenario predicts and how we can get there, uh, I'm going to leave to Julie Wedege to explain. She's Vice President for Politics, Ownership and Climate at Startcraft. And I'm happy to hand the digital scene over to her. And you're already uh, there, so just continue to ask questions through Slido. Some of them will be spared for the panel discussion because they deserve uh, to be answered by several people. So keep on doing that and in meanwhile I'm going to say to Julie the screen is yours take it away hello my name is Julie Verga I'm the vice president uh, in Southcraft for politics ownership and climate and I'm very happy to be here talking with you today I just want to start with this picture of Ulla Ferra the largest hydropower magazine in Norway and Northern Europe and the reason I start with this picture is that this is Stadkraft's origin, the hydropower constructions who gives power to homes and industry in Norway. And hydropower is both a hundred year old technology, but at the same time, it is the renewable and modern technology we need, providing flexibility when solar and wind are entering into the energy system and when we are increasing electrification of the society. Since our beginning, Statkraft has grown both internationally and in different renewable technologies. We are now present in 16 countries in three continents, Europe, India and South America, with 4,000 employees. So in Statkraft, we follow energy markets closely and in order to understand what could happen going forward, we develop various energy scenarios. Now, the last 10 years, we have seen a massive fall in the technology costs in re renewables. While wind power costs have been halved, the cost for solar power and batteries are now as little as 20% of the price level we saw 10 years ago. In one of our scenarios, we assume that this development will continue with unprecedented change. We call that scenario the low emission scenario. We believe that to be an optimistic but realistic scenario. So we released it about 10 days ago and I just wanted to share a few highlights of this year's report. 
already the consequence of this price drop is that the European electricity production is becoming much, much greener. Even if you don't include hydropower, renewable energy is now bigger than coal in Europe. Coal production is down 40% since its highest production year, and renewables has more than doubled since 2000. During the same period, the CO2 intensity in European power supply has decreased by 30%. This is a slide showing investment in the, in the power sector globally. 75% of investments in new power generation today is in renewables, and it has been so over several years. The result is that also globally, the CO2 intensity is starting to fall from the power sector. And this graph shows the cost of power generation in Western Europe in 2025. As you can see, it is cheaper to install new renewable power than to invest in new ga gas or coal power. But then we also see that where there are good renewable resources, it is starting to become more profitable to invest in new renewable rather than running existing coal and gas. And that is really a game changer. So you could question how fast prices will go down and how fast the game will change but the low cost of building renewables is undisputable. And the result is that globally in 2050, we expect that the share of zero emission power generation, including nuclear in the power sector will grow to almost 90%. And as renewables are becoming cheaper and cheaper, we believe electrification of society will continue to increase. This slide shows how the sectors in Europe could be decarbonized most efficiently. Energy efficiency is obviously needed, but then electrification follows as the solution that will dominate the energy system. As you can see, electrification will play a major role in the sectors of transport, buildings and industry. Where direct electrification becomes challenging for technical reasons, we do believe there will be a need for hydrogen, as you can see, quite substantially in all sectors. And we see a role for both blue and green hydrogen. So if this optimistic, realistic scenario becomes a reality, we will we then reach our climate targets? Well, as this graph shows, the scenario will take us fairly close to the two degree track in 2050 here on the left hand side. But even this scenario, which some would argue is quite optimistic, it doesn't put us on track for 1.5 track, uh, 1.5 degree in 2050 as you could see here on the right. And to me, that kind of illustrates the daunting task that climate policy really is. The amount of invest investments and societal change that we will need in order to reach the climate targets. Even during lockdown, we only saw a 70% reduction in emissions. And what we really do need is a 50% emission cut in 2030 in order to reach 1.5 degree in 2050. And that really shows that what we need is a structural change. We need to replace fossil fuels with renewables. And luckily, even if there clearly are some gloomy trends internationally in politics, we also see positive political trends supporting the market developments. The European Green Deal launched by the European Union is a deep and ambitious plan to decarbonize all sectors of the society. A few years ago, <clears throat> Startcraft changed its strategy in order to meet the market trends. And the new growth strategy consolidated Startcraft for further as a broad renewable company with four pillars. So we will optimize and expand the hydropower portfolio. We will massively ramp up as a developer of new wind and solar projects. We will grow our customer business, providing tailor-made solutions for the customers, and we will develop new business initiatives related to energy transition, such as electrification, hydrogen, biofuels, etc. Now, the foundation for all of this is our deep market insights and experience, which is a competitive advantage as renewables are turning more and more commercial. We are, in fact, Europe's largest producer of renewable energy, and we are also the utility in Europe with the lowest emissions 
per kilowatt hour of produced electricity. So you could say we are the biggest, but also the greenest. I just wanted to end by encouraging you to consider renewables for a career going forward. Uh, we have been employing trainees even during uh, lockdown, so please check out our career sites regularly. My 10 minutes are up. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Julie. That was very interesting. And it's also nice to see that you are um, employing as well during these relatively tough times for a lot of us. So uh, you can turn your camera and your microphone back on. Uh, there you are. Hello again. Uh, and um, a couple of questions. I'm just going to just going to look at my mobile phone to see what is happening on Slido. But before I do that, um, electricity is obviously the answer. Uh, and the solution to a lot of things, uh, as you were explaining. And you you showed us that the costs of renewable energy um, production uh, have fallen dramatically and extremely rapidly. Do you think this is a development that is going to continue or, or can it continue? I mean, the prices are really low at the moment. Yes, I mean, that's exactly what the scenario is. is uh stating and and that's absolutely our belief that they will continue to fall quite rapidly and quite substantially for a long time until 2050 so we do expect that to to continue and that's driven by market and technology plus not necessarily public yeah and there's a question uh, regarding this um, do you see any accelerated transition or tipping points because of this change in you know investment being uh, profitable versus just running existing uh, oil and gas uh, facilities is this a tipping point are we now uh, moving away from the um the scenarios that we've been given for so many years that you know the fossil fuels will be a huge part of the energy mix for years to come. Is, is this a new, is this a new um, narrative in a way? Well, I could just say, I mean, first of all, this is a scenario about renewables. So we, we don't really have a clear opinion about fossils. So, you know, in, in isolation, but, but obviously this will have consequences for fossil fuels as well. And what we do see is that it will be more profitable, as I said, to invest in new renewable than existing fossils in many places. And that, I mean, that's quite a heavy game changer and the tipping point, I would say. And we also do expect, if this scenario plays out, that uh, coal will be, you have a peak demand in 2025. I mean, after that, it will, will decrease. We do see a peak in oil demand seven years after that. Um, but gas will, you know, consistently be with us. But we do see some trends also from the European Union on of a more political uh, manner rather than just a, sort of. I mean, the first two trends about oil, about fossils and, and coal is is mainly just markets. But we do also see sort of political signals on gas. So. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of that and the European Green Deal that you just mentioned. Um, what kind of role do you see for Norway in that perspective? And now you can choose to answer Norway as a nation or Norway as the home of Stadkraft. That's up to no, you. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll choose both. Yeah, and I think they're quite the, quite closely interlinked. Uh, well, first of all, I think you know, I think Green Deal is really the market development is there anyhow. So you can't, we can't really escape that. I mean, no matter which industry you belong to in Norway. Uh, secondly, I think Green Deal is really good news for Norway because what the European Union wants is exactly what we have. You know, we do have high, uh, we are, we're the most electrified country, we have green value chains already, we have a lot of confidence and we have the natural resources and the possibility to make hydrogen. I think, I mean, we actually have what the European Union will now require more of, so that's pretty much very good news for Norway. Uh, for Starcraft, I mean, obviously, as a European company present in, um, in many European countries, I mean, we just see this is a kind of supercharger for our strategy. Uh, you know, this is kind of really igniting what we're already doing. Yeah. 
Good. Uh, there are several questions popping up uh, in Slido, and I think um, a lot of them could also um, be dealt with during the panel discussion, because time is running quickly when we have a good time, which we are now. So I, I think I'm actually going to save these for later, Julie. So thank you very much so far. Looking forward to hearing from you again and seeing you again during the discussion. Thank you. So thanks. Now, we've heard from academia and from the industry, both on a slightly optimistic note. And then I wonder what kind of tune will be played by an Indian environmentalist? Chandra Bhushan is president and CEO of the International Forum for Environment, Sustainability and Technology located in New Delhi, India. He is a passionate communicator for a better environment, but not only that, he wants the transition to be just as, as well and points out that this perspective is less talked about when political leaders around the world are carving out their roadmaps and strategies. So what does it take to make India transform its coal-based economy into a renewable one? Let's lend an aid to Chandra Bhushan. Good afternoon. Let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this uh, very interesting webinar on Energy Transition 2020, uh, Visions of the Future. Now, to have a vision, one must have a basis. And the basis that I have chosen to propound my uh, vision for the future is the IPCC target of 1.5 degree Celsius. Now, we need to keep global warming within 1.5 degrees Celsius to avoid catastrophic impacts. Now, we all know that it is a humongous challenge, but we also know what needs to be done to meet this challenge. If we want to meet 1.5 C target, we will have to reduce global emissions by 45% by 2030 and reach net zero emissions by 2050. Renewables will have to meet 85 to 90 percent of global electricity supply. Practically, we will have to shut down all coal-fired power plants and a large majority of, of gas-fired power plants as well. Our transportation sector will have to shift to zero carbon technologies. CO2 emissions from industry will have to reduce by anywhere between 75 to 90 percent. And on top of all these technological changes, uh, we will have to uh, increase forest cover significantly uh, to sequester CO2. Now, this is a big challenge. Doing all these will require all resources and ingenuity uh, uh, to, meet, to meet these challenge. Now, can this be done? I believe that we can do it. And we can do it by, first of all, putting in place policies, programs, and transforming the market for a rapid transition to renewables and other zero carbon technologies on one hand, and putting policies and plans for a just transition for fossil fuel dependent workers, community, and regions. Now, it is important to understand that in the last 10 to 15 years, most of us have talked about rapid transition but there has been very little work done on the aspect of just transition. But I believe that if we really want to see the transition to happen, the real transition to happen, then we will have to find answers for both. Rapid transition, which is largely a techno-economic transition, and just transition, which is a much more difficult political economic transition. And these two transitions will have to happen across the world. Every country will have to think about rapid transition and just transition for their fossil fuel dependent communities. Now, I'm going to take the example of India to illustrate whether it is possible for India to do rapid transition towards renewable and just transition away from fossil fuel economy. So the question that I have put in front of me is, is that can India decarbonize its energy supply by 2050? Now, to, to understand that, you have to understand the energy basket of India. India is largely a fossil fuel dependent economy. Three-fourths of our energy comes from fossil fuels. Coal, 
alone supplies 45% of our primary energy. Oil is about 23-24%. Natural gas is 5%. And then we have 20% biomass, uh, which is a highly polluting fuel and which is causing uh, air pollution as well as has huge, huge health implications on women folk. Now, this is the energy basket of India. So on one hand, we are fossil fuel dependent. On the other hand, we are energy poor. The per capita energy consumption in India is about a third of global average. So going ahead, as India grows its economy to meet the requirements of the economy as well as livelihoods of people, it will have to increase energy consumption as well, because we are at this point of time consuming significant, significantly lower uh, amount of energy uh, than is required to provide decent livelihood to the majority of the population. So we face a dual challenge. On one hand, we will have to uh, reduce fossil fuel use significantly. On the other hand, we are also, uh, we will also have to increase our energy consumption. Now, can these, this dual challenge be met? I believe it is. And there are really positive trends uh, that is emerging in the country. The first trend is uh, falling costs of renewables. Over the last 10 years, uh, the cost of renewable energy uh, has fallen significantly in India. For example, uh, the total cost of utility scale uh, solar PV, the total installed cost of utility scale solar PV has reduced by 88% since 2010. In 2015, the levelized cost of energy for solar and wind was anywhere between 70 to 80% more expensive than coal power. Today, both of them are 10 to 15% cheaper than coal power. In fact, today, the cheapest source of electricity in India is solar and wind. And therefore, India is installing uh, renewable energy at a rapid pace. Uh, for example, the installation of grid-connected solar PV has increased at 50% annually since 2015. In 2015, we had only about 3.7 gigawatts of, of grid-connected solar PV. Today, we have 28.2 gigawatt of grid-connected solar PV. The second trend is super efficiency. In fact, we are today moving towards a world, world of watts and not kilowatts. And we will have to accelerate this, this transition. Uh, and we have to accelerate this transition even more. We today live in a world of seven watt LED. Just a few years back, we used to live in a world of 60 watt incandescent bulb. And this transition has, has, has happened just in the last five years in India. The growth of LED market in India has been nothing less than spectacular. It used to be about $75 million market in 2010. It reached $1.75 billion in 2016. Today, estimates are that it is already about $2.5 billion market. In fact, LED bulb today dominates the lighting market in India. And this transition towards super efficiency is, is happening in a number of sectors, from fans to uh, air conditioner to refrigerators to televisions. In most of the household appliances, we see significant improvement in energy efficiency. And as I said, we will have to accelerate this trend further. The third trend is the battery world, the trend in which battery and other storage technology is going to dominate the way we produce, store, and consume electricity. Now, this is happening on the back of a global innovation. It is not only happening in India. In fact, India and other countries are benefiting uh, out of global innovation that is happening in the battery technology. Now, we have already achieved significant uh, improvements uh, in the battery technology. In fact, I saw this uh, slide to people who are skeptical about the battery world, and this is what has happened in the last 40 years. 40 years back, for one hour of talk time, we had to charge our mobile phone for 20 hours. Today, for one hour of talk time, we have to charge our mobile phones for three minutes. And therefore, in, 
on the matrix of charge time and talk time, the battery technology has improved by close to 500 times. And please remember 40 years back, that mobile phone was not affordable for the most. Today, this mobile phone is for the masses. So we have seen significant improvement in battery technology over the last four decades. Going ahead, we need another 10 to 15 times improvement in battery technology. And that is already happening on the cost matrix, the cost of lithium ion batteries, for instance, has reduced by 80% since 2010. And today batteries are not only being used for, for automobile sector and for mobile telephony and, and other appliances, they're also being used for grid scale storage. And India is putting in, in place number of pilots, uh, megawatt scale pilots on grid scale battery storage uh, in, in different parts of the country. So we, are, we have started to move towards uh, a battery world where renewable plus battery will be able to provide 24 seven electricity to all of us. The last trend is smart grid, which, which is actually a co-benefit agenda for a country like India where transmission and distribution losses are very, very high. And smart grid will not only reduce TND losses for us, it will also improve quality of electricity, will improve efficiency of use as well as reduce cost. And therefore, we are putting in place policies, uh, for example, on net metering, open access is allowed in the country, smart meters are being, uh, being installed. As I said, we have pilot projects on battery storage, time of the day payment is happening, there is flexible uh, demand and supply system put in place, and we are using more and more artificial intelligence and other technologies to make our grid smart. Now, a lot more needs to be done, a lot more investment is required, but this trend is already visible. Now, once you put in place all these four trends, falling costs of renewable, innovation in battery technology, smart grid, and super efficiency, what you, the, the first outcome that comes is that electricity is now potentially the biggest contender to become the prime mover. And therefore, inexpensive renewable electricity with storage can practically replace fossil fuel in, in almost all uses in next few years, if not decades. There would be exceptions in industries like cement and steel and fertilizer, it, was, it is not going to be possible. We will have to move towards an hydrogen economy. And similarly in, in transport sector, especially heavy duty transport sector, uh, we will have to think about hydrogen and, and, and other technologies uh, to reach uh, zero, emission, uh, uh, zero emission performance. So, but for the large part of our economy, we can use renewable electricity and storage uh, uh, to, move, to move further. Now, the second outcome is this movement to uh, electricity as the prime mover will be affordable for the poor. There is a concern that transition to a renewable world is going to be expensive, but the evidence is absolutely opposite to that. In fact, in India, today the cheapest source of cooking fuel is electricity. In fact, induction cooking is half the cost of LPG. You can see on the left side of this slide, picture of a gentleman who is running a tea stall in rural part of India, and he is using induction a stove uh, uh, to make tea, simply because it is the cheapest source of energy for him. And we see this trend in the paratransit uh, sector as well. Today, the cheapest source of paratransit for the poor in India is electric rickshaw. And therefore today, India has more electric rickshaw than electric cars in China, and this sector is, is growing. So, the transition to a renewable zero carbon world will be affordable. It need not be expensive. In fact, I'm saying will be, it will be affordable for the poor. Now, based on this, we can build a new energy architecture, which will be based on electricity. 
It will be an architecture which will be an Uber model in which prosumers and aggregators would replace large utilities. We will have decentralized distributed network and grid would become a medium of exchange. In fact, electricity grid of the future will be similar to information highway and the new energy architecture will be similar to internet. Now, all these technologies exist. They are today, some of them are expensive, but they are going to become cheaper very soon. And therefore, rapid transition is possible. Rapid transition is also affordable. Rapid transition is also good for the poor. Now, the problem is the just transition. As I said, while rapid transition is a techno-economic challenge, just transition is a political economic challenge. Now, this is the coal map of India. Today, coal mining is an important source of, of growth and livelihood in about 25 to 30 districts of India. The total population of these districts would be about anywhere between 50 to 60 million. Now, these are coal-centric economies. Most of them are also informal economies. Majority of employment in, in, in these areas are uh, in informal sector, informal coal sector. And therefore, there's a strong political support for coal. Now, how do you close and transition these areas away from coal mining is a major challenge for a country like India. And similar challenges will be witnessed in other parts of the world as well. Now, therefore, the, the issue in front of us is how do we close existing fossil fuel industry, coal and gas-based plants, coal mines, oil wells, how do we close them? What do we replace them with? How do we build an alternate resilient economy uh, in these areas? And most importantly, who pays for it and how? And therefore, as I said, just transition is going to be a major political and economic transition. I have a vision, which is that in this transition towards zero carbon world, people who are dependent on fossil fuels should not suffer, but I don't have answers. In fact, very few people have answers uh, on how do we do just transition. Let me end by saying that we will have to embrace a, a vision in which both rapid transition and just transition will have to take place. Simply rapid transition to renewable technology is not going, to, not going to be sufficient. In fact, I very strongly believe that a zero carbon world will not happen because we have technology or because it is affordable. It will only happen if we have political support for it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chandra, for that very interesting and thought-provoking presentation uh, and very precise, as well, if I might add. And uh, good afternoon to you in Delhi. Uh, first of all, I, I've just I really enjoyed your example with the mobile phone batteries, how they have changed through the last four decades, which is a very good symbol, in a way, uh, of the very quick and rapid transition that we're seeing and, and the development within technology. But uh, you were saying that India is in many ways already rigged for managing both a rapid and a just transition. But the politics aren't there yet. You said this requires political leadership. So how do you get there? What does it take to, to make these political um, choices to be made? Um, why isn't that happening? Oh, I lost my pen in, in all of this. <laughs> Go ahead, Chandra. I, I think it is important to understand that political choices are both what will happen nationally and what will happen internationally. Because we are talking about a zero carbon world in the context of global warming, the term is global. And therefore, every country is looking at each other uh, in terms of who's, doing, who's going to do what. So I, I think the answer for political leadership will not only be national, it will also be international. Unfortunately, I do see uh, in many countries, uh, national leadership emerging, 
if not to the extent that we want, but international leadership, international collaboration on climate change has just gone out of the gate. I mean to say, uh, with, with what is happening at the UNFCCC and Donald Trump moving out of the Paris Agreement, in any case, Paris Agreement was not going to be sufficient. Uh, we wanted, uh, if you want to meet 1.5 or 2 degrees, you need much, much better agreement than, than Paris Agreement. So I think the answer is not only national, uh, we need also a global leadership uh, on this issue. Definitely. And you said towards the end of your presentation that um, I don't have answers because uh, you are asking a lot of questions, but the audience uh, is also asking questions for you. And there's one that I think um, you might have some perspectives on it. So how do you see the potential for biogas in India using waste, sewage and manure as methane capture and use could be relatively cheaper, local, just solutions? What do you think about that? Well, there, there is already a lot of work happening on, on biomass based energy, and biogas is uh, one of them. There is obviously a lot more potential uh, on biomass. Uh, if you look at the energy basket of India, 20% of primary energy comes from bio, biomass, and most of them are burnt. Now, we have modern technology to convert that 20% biomass, which is a renewable source, uh, into a much cleaner fuel. Uh, that is biogas, and, and obviously there's a huge potential uh, that biogas can can provide cooking energy in rural India. But if we can do it on a scale, it can also supply uh, energy to industries. So yes, there's there's obviously a lot of potential there. Mm. And another question, you, you mentioned it briefly on one of your final slides, I think it was, uh, and this goes into depth into how to go beyond replacing existing fossil fuel based with renewable energy sources based appliances, going from that simple transition towards creating an active role for local consumers, both citizens and professional ones. And you, you were talking about the coal based and informal economy. Maybe that is something one could look into, but how do you actually do that? So uh, when I say uh, informal economy and coal, it is important to understand that developing countries, what differentiates say developed countries and developing countries or you can say industrialized uh, economies and emerging economies is the formal nature of, of the economy. In our part of the world, the formal economy, quote unquote, is a, a smaller part of the total economy. And then, so when someone says that it's a coal economy, it could mean that 70% of all the employment is an informal sector, uh, which could be, you know, individual gathering coal and refining coal and selling it to cities in small quantities. So for a, for a Western audience, it is an alien concept, okay? Uh, it's something that you would have done in 19th century but that, that do exist now. You have individual coal miners who mine coal, uh, you know, and sell it to the market. And that could be 70 to 80% of the economy. How do you move them who, who are really poor people? How do you move them, tell them I'm going to close down coal mines? But what is the alternative that you're going to give it to them? It's very easy to say, give them solar power, but what the hell are they going to do with solar power? Okay, so I don't think we have we, we have actually understood what it means to replace uh, a, a fossil fuel community to a non-fossil fuel one, and what alternatives exist. How do we do that transition? It requires a lot more work. Well, Chandra, I think we're going to stop there at the moment. Of course, you are uh, returning for the panel discussion as well. So we're really looking forward to seeing you again there. So once again, thank you for your very nice presentation and uh, see you in 12, 13, 15 minutes. So you can just turn yeah. off your camera now and uh, we'll, we'll let you join in later on. Thank you very much. Now, Chandra, he was calling out for political commitment. Therefore, I'm particularly happy that we have a representative from the political side, actually from our own Norwegian government here today. 
I'm certain that he's more than ready to discuss the challenges of a rapid and just transition with Chandra and the rest of the speakers panel shortly. But first, we are going to give Tony Christian Tiller, State Secretary in the Norwegian Ministry of Petroleum and Energy, and representing the Conservative Party, some minutes to explain why he is optimistic about the future of energy and the energy transition. And as usual, there will be a short Q&A session afterwards, so don't hesitate to use the Slido code ET Visions Future. You're already doing that quite well. And I'm, as I've told you, I'm going to save some questions for the discussion later on. So now, please, Tony Taylor, the scene is yours. Dear all, it's a great pleasure to attend this webinar on visions for the future, generously hosted by our leading technological university and my alumni, MTNU. My name is Tony Christian Tillet, and I'm State Secretary for the Conservative Party, HEDE, in the Norwegian Ministry of Petroleum and Energy. I was invited to speak at the original Energy Transition Conference back in March. That seems like a long time ago. Since then, the COVID-19 pandemic has not only influenced our daily lives, how we organize our work, it has also influenced and disrupted global energy markets. However, there are reasons for optimism. According to the low emissions scenario of Stadtkraft, renewable energy has continued to grow even during and after the outbreak of the virus. That serves as a bridge to our topic of the day, visions for the future. The future is difficult to predict. Some would even say impossible. Nevertheless, we need a starting point and we need to have an idea of where we are heading. What we do know is the change is happening faster than ever before. Driven by the need to cut climate gas emissions and to fuel the growth of a growing economy. We are experiencing a transformation in the way we produce, distribute and consume energy. Our government's ambition is to achieve a low emissions society by 2050 where we have reduced emissions between 90 and 95 percent compared to levels in 1990. That's a bold target and there's still some unanswered questions of how do we get there? What technologies will prevail? What new technologies will need to be developed? What's the best overall approach to achieve a low emissions society? Perhaps we should even expect the unexpected. There are many items on the energy transition menu, and I only have time to mention a few. I see three main reasons for optimism. First, we have the resources. In Norway, we're blessed with abundant natural resources. We're known for our considerable oil and gas resources, but renewable energy our, makes sure our domestic electric, electricity supply consists almost entirely of flexible hydropower. And not only that, we have excellent wind resources, both onshore and offshore. Currently, there's a lot of momentum on hydrogen. So this June, our government launched a new national hydrogen strategy. The document addresses both production and use of hydrogen in Norway and internationally. The maritime sector is important to Norway and together with heavy transportation and industrial processes, we believe hydrogen can be a key contributor in these important sectors in Norway. I'll jump quickly to my second reason for optimism, which is technology. 
If we are to reach our objective of a low emissions society, we must successfully develop, adapt and implement new technologies in several areas. Technology is absolutely essential to reaching our goals of a low emissions society. Some technological improvements may be minor to existing known technologies. Others may be truly groundbreaking and bold innovations. In any case, I think we need them all. So please allow me to mention a couple of examples. Last week, my minister Tina Bru attended the opening of a new battery lab at Kjellø just outside Oslo. The demand for batteries is expected to grow significantly in the years to come. And much of this growth is driven by electric mobility. This is an area that's familiar to many Norwegians. Electrification is happening as we speak and the transportation sector is very important to Norwegian targets and we really are leading the way in electric vehicles and also electric car ferries and other examples from the transportation sector. So just a minor improvement in battery capacity can have a great impact. The second example I would like to mention is offshore wind. In August 2019, our government decided to support the development of High Wind Tampen, a floating offshore wind farm with a total 2.3 billion Norwegian kroner uh, support from the state enterprise ENOVA. When it's completed, it will be the world's first and I believe largest floating offshore wind farm, supplying renewable power to offshore oil and gas installations. The High Wind Tampen project will contribute to further development of floating offshore wind technology and reduce, hopefully, reduce the cost for future floating offshore wind farms. That's a groundbreaking project, truly demonstrating the project, the, excuse me, the potential of offshore wind in really deep waters. I could go on and mention a lot more examples, but no matter how different our starting points may be, research and technology development will be essential for all aspects of the energy transition, combined with policy, of course. The third and last ingredient I would like to add is not technology nor a source of energy, but people. In times where digitalization artificial intelligence, machine learning and robots are buzzwords and talk of the town. We should never lose track of the fact that we need the right people with the right competence to manage the energy transition. There's a limit to what computers and machines can do. That's why we need creative and innovative people to solve challenges and clear the path towards a low emissions society. Furthermore, when recruiting, we have to make sure we get the best talents. Our broad energy industry is still in 2020 somewhat unbalanced when it comes to gender, and we certainly need more women. That was also the background for my minister's decision last week to organize a working lunch for women in the energy industry. Daryl, my 10 minutes is about up. Research, technology, people, all key ingredients in our vision for the future and our path to the low emission society. Achieving this will take time and hard work from everyone, industry, research communities, authorities, students, universities, citizens. Our government will support this transition. So dear friends, climate change knows no borders and international cooperation is key. Our common challenge is cutting emissions while ensuring affordable energy for all. That's a tall order and failure is not on the menu. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, that was very interesting. And I know that you are, yeah, there you are. 
you aren't currently in Trondheim. I have to add, I'm in Oslo, so that's why we're not together. So hello. And uh, now we can see Tony, and I think we're going to have a camera zoom into you because you're the one in focus right now. I hope you're enjoying your visit at NTNU. And we could see a couple of others uh, right next to you again. We're getting back to them later on. Now, you mentioned a couple of examples of technology being developed in Norway at the moment, such as hydrogen, the new battery lab at Kjellert, Highwind Tampen. These are all big projects, things to be proud of. However, you did not bring up CCS, carbon capture and storage. Uh, that is a technology that I guess your party would be very interested in both developing and implementing, not to mention the government would be interested in that as well. So there are a couple of CCS projects um, going on at the moment, research and innovati innovation projects. And I know that they are eagerly waiting for use of continued financial support. But I also know that you won't be able to say anything about that in particular right now, as the state budget for 2021 is in the making right now. But in general, now this was a long introduction for a rather short question. Do you think that we can manage without CCS? Um, no, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, and thank you for your question. Um, it was in my, it was in the original manuscript, but I only had ten minutes, and I'm, I was pretty sure uh, CCS would come up in the dialogue anyway. So um, I, I left it out as a, a deliberate teaser for the for our dialogue. Um, and um, you're absolutely right. We're about three weeks away now from. Um, from uh, when we put our st uh, state budget proposition forward to, to Parliament. Um, and uh, as we have said now for quite some time, we, we have been working on, uh, on an investment decision uh, material for, for, um, for Parliament that we uh, hopefully can, can put forward. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's, really, it's been really interesting to listen to, to the previous um, um, speakers we had here and I think it just serves to prove the the difference and variety in in uh, take India on the one hand and Norway on the other it's, they're, they're quite different uh, starting points and, and challenges that we are facing and for our part uh, I think um, uh, we're already there where we have a lot of renewable energy we're, we're rapidly um, electrifying our transportation sector. There's a lot of work left to do, but we really also have to take a hard look at process industry uh, and to decarbonize uh, natural gas and what's going to be left in the energy sector. So, yes, I think across governments and for, for many, many years now, Norway has supported um, and funded research uh, on CCS. And um, I think we're all hoping for... Uh, for a real breakthrough um, sometime soon. Stopping now would probably not be a good idea then. That is what I'm I'm hearing uh, from you now. I think that would be a politically a very uh, challenging um, proposition, yes. Yes. <laughs> good, so but, but, but as you said, you, you had another manuscript probably with, you know, if you had some more time, you would have talked about this nevertheless, but it, this is not, only about CCS, of course, and we have a lot of questions and, and different uh, angles to look at. Uh, before I'm going to re-invite the other speakers, I would like to just um, uh, convey a couple of comments from uh, Slido, from the audience. Uh, and there's someone here who said, did I understand it correctly, offshore wind for the oil and gas industry? And yes, that is correct, isn't it? Because uh, you are about to electrify with offshore wind the production on the platforms, isn't that so? That's absolutely so. And um, I think that's, it's a project that I think the, the company is developing is really proud of and that we as a government is, is proud to support because uh, it, re it really is uh, a great technological breakthrough uh, and also serves as a, a bridge between uh, our uh, oil and gas sector and the future of renewables. Uh, I, I think in all these scenarios, I, I mean, we could discuss up and down uh, when will we have peak oil, 
uh, when uh, when can we reach net zero? Um, and I have no doubt in my mind that that oil, oil and gas resources will will become less uh, important in the future. Uh, however, uh, until we get there, I think uh, it's a really good idea to uh, to have the most carbon efficient and the most environmentally friendly, if I can use that term, uh, speaking of petroleum resources. Uh, so, uh, so the idea is simply to uh, generate electricity for one hour oil and gas installations from floating offshore wind uh, turbines, uh, and that will lower emissions from the production. Uh, Obviously, it won't solve the problem of emissions uh, at, at the end user, uh, but that's that's one way of uh, of uh, reducing emissions from our uh, uh, petroleum industry. And uh, uh, the beautiful thing is, then we can help reduce costs, and then we can use this uh, technology in other areas as well. So um, I think it's a great project. Yeah. So, Tony, you and I are not going to, to have this conversation alone, of course, so I would like to re-invite now the three other speakers that we've met, because now we've heard from all of you, it's time to engage you in a discussion between the four of you. So, Edgar, Julie and Chandra, you can turn the cameras and microphones on. Now, I haven't uh, finished uh, the question line with Tony yet, and you mentioned stuff cupped. Um, in your presentation and their low emission scenario and Julie gave us some highlights from their updated version which was published last week, well uh, 10 days ago to be precise I think. Um, she says or she said it is optimistic but realistic. Do you agree on that Tony? Uh, I'm really sorry I didn't catch the question. Optimistic and pessimistic at the same time was that? No. Optimistic and realistic. Optimistic and realistic. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think uh, I, um, I haven't read uh, the report from Southcraft in, in detail, uh, the, the, the most recent one. But uh, of course, I mean, for Norway, uh, I mean, we have been dreaming of becoming Europe's green battery for years now. But but the way things are developing, it, it's really looking better and better. But there's, um, I think, politically, there are some real obstacles that we need to to uh, to clear, um, we have had some some um, real tough dis uh, discussions uh, in our country in the last couple of years. Uh, um, should we should our aim be to to um, generate more jobs from from our renewable energy resources in our industry here at home, or is it okay to <clears throat> To export more of it to to uh, to other countries, uh, how much of it should we build? I mean, wind power on land, obviously, very politically uh, disputed. Uh, so, um, I mean, there's, I think, optimism and and a bit of realism is a good combination. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, you're smiling. Um, what do you think when listening to Tony? Um, what actions are needed on the political level in order to make the systemic change that you were talking about? Because this is this is a structural change that we need. It's not, you know, uh, giving new paint to to old walls. Well, I would just like to say that uh, first of all, the scenario is realistic in the sense that we just have to let the trend continue. You know, we just have to let the the, the trend actually work out. So it doesn't really. It doesn't really require any sort of revolutionary politicians on the top of the Ministry of Petroleum. You know, it just requires steady, good political and energy political work. So, uh, as we have seen, so I just think it's uh, this is similar to DNB's basis scenario. You know, our our optimistic scenario. So it's kind of pretty middle ground, I would say. Um, when it comes to what do we need, you know, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid to be too servile towards uh, towards the government there, but I think we need a lot of what they're actually providing. We need stable framework conditions. We need renewables to be profitable. You know, we need it to be value creating. And Chandra and Tony has both mentioned kind of important barriers for renewable and electrification transition, and that's you know it it resistance towards costs, it resistance towards you know, insecurity for your job. Uh, do you want more renewable energy to be built out in the nature we love? I mean, that's kind of 
the wind power debate in Norway is obvious, but also the yellow west in Paris and, uh, and so on. So what we do need is well-functioning markets, well-functioning, it's a boring but true answer. We need well-functioning markets, we need well-functioning carbon markets. Um, but what we really need an emphasis on is the demand in the sector, which is hard to drive, and that uh, within electrification and hydrogen. So we need support and you know ignition on those sectors, which is not which market doesn't run in its uh, in its own right. And I, I would sort of recommend and, and and highlight the hydrogen, the new signal from the government on the hydrogen is very well in that regard, and also from the European Union. Tony, I, I can see that you're writing down. Would you like to comment uh, directly to, to Julie? Um, no, I think uh, she's absolutely right. And that's, uh, I mean, profitable renewables, that's the that's one of the pillars of, uh, of our long-term uh, energy uh, policy. But then again, profitable for who? <laughs> um, I mean, there are very good propositions for, uh, you know, we have fantastic renewable uh, resources uh, in Norway. Uh, our offshore wind potential is great. Our offshore uh, land potential uh, is great. Uh, we need to probably get more out of our hydropower. power. Um, but who's going to pay for it and who's going to profit from it? So these are the political questions that we are, uh, you know, uh, constantly trying to weigh. Um, and I think I'm glad Julie is saying we're doing a pretty good job at it. Um, but uh, there's definitely um, uh, some answer, unanswered questions. Uh, as for hydrogen, I'm, I'm sure we'll get back to that. Uh, I, I think it's a really... Uh, I've only been state secretary for, uh, for a half year, but I, I've learned a lot about hydrogen um, in this uh, short time. And I, I, there's, there's a great uh, enthusiasm and uh, optimism uh, surrounding all the opportunities. Uh, and what's, what's our challenge is to... Um, uh, set up a framework that you know supports the the best projects. I think uh, so. So uh, um, you know we need to be careful about the taxpayers' money as well. Uh, and a lot of these projects uh, seems to me have a they're kind of kind of high risk, um, but also potentially the reward is great. Uh, and um, as Julie mentioned, uh, our prime minister did a make a very. Uh, Firm announcement that we will uh, support the development of hydrogen solutions uh, going forward. So we, we're actually, as we speak, we're going back to the, the to our uh, desks uh, in our department and uh, need to, to to work out this roadmap that the prime minister signalised uh, uh, before the weekend. Um, you mentioned that we have to be careful with our taxpayers' money. I think that was exactly what you just said, and um, uh, of. Of course, throughout the years, uh, Julie, you have to correct me if I'm wrong now, but um, Statkraft has had its special kind of reinvestment scheme, uh, not really allowing them to, to, to grow big. And you said, who is going to profit on what? Um, Tony, you said that. And uh, I was just wondering if you look at the oil and gas industry versus hydropower and renewable industry. Someone might say that it has been a bit, uh, the, the market mechanisms have been a bit different uh, if you look at it from, from, the, from the political side. Julie, would you like to elaborate or even comment on that a bit? Uh, how easy or how difficult has it been for Startcup to, to, to grow as a company and to invest in new markets as you are doing right now? And you told us you are present in 16 different countries on three continents. So you've managed, but it has not been an easy ride, I think. Um, I, I'm not sure if I would second that. I think we have a very well-functioning and, um, and well-working dividend model who allows us to reinvest uh, what we actually earn uh, outside uh, Norwegian Hydro, 75% of it. Um, I think we have proved that we do create profitability and exceeds the expectations from our owner. Um, and we are, you know, we are actually growing uh, one gigawatt a year from 2018 to 2025. And <clears throat> I think we have a very sort of ambitious and steady growth plan and growth strategy. So, so we are, we've been sort of very happy with the stability that has been provided in this dividend model. Yeah. So, um, no, no complaints, basically. <laughs> 
that's good. That's good. Um, there was a question here, Tony, and please ex forgive me, uh, Edgar and Chandra. I'm, I will let you in soon. Uh, but um, just a, another question from the audience that I would like to ask uh, Tony. When making political decisions to further invest in fossil fuel production, are the costs of worsened climate change included when calculating profit, uh, profitability? That's a big question. Uh, that's a big question, and um, yeah, we're, uh, apologies to our international guests, and we're being very uh, uh, Norway-centric here, but uh, we do try to, um, I think we have a, a, a very str strong environmental framework overall on our uh, oil and gas industry. But it, uh, the main sort of pillar in our policy is, I mean, it's we 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 have in place uh, uh, the EU ETS, and we have in place uh, a special Norwegian carbon tax on our petroleum production, and um, we don't leave it entirely to the market. Outside of that, we also do. I mean, we already talked about Hyvin Tampen as an example of how we support technological um, development to reduce emissions. Uh, outside of that. There, there have to be market mechanisms, and 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 in in the longer term, when 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 the day comes that we will, uh, and it will come, <laughs> when we will no longer be producing oil and gas resources from our continental shelf, uh, it will most likely be as a result of no more demand rather than uh, a political uh, decision. But who knows about the future? But definitely, yeah, uh, the climate risk or or the the which is also you know. What do you think the price of oil is going to be in the future is baked into every investment decision that is made uh, on the Norwegian continental shelf and it's also something that the government is is uh, looking after but uh, uh, it's uh, uh, we are at least currently we're very far from a situation where we would say oh because of this and that scenario we, we will stop looking for new resources because we also need to replenish uh, some of the, the, the resources that we already have. So um, it's, a, it's a very complicated uh, topic, but I, I think we have, we have um, every reason to be proud of the, uh, of the uh, regulatory framework we have for our petroleum industry also uh, when it comes to, um, to the environment and, and, and pricing uh, carbon emissions. Uh, you said it yourself, Tony. We are uh, being a little bit impolite here because we're just talking, you know, about Norwegian um, challenges in a way. Um, but um, Chandra, he uh, told us that there is no serious discussion on just transitions around the world today. Uh, I would like you to comment on that, Tony, and maybe start with defining what you see as a just transition. Well, I was uh, I found your talk, uh, genre very very interesting, and uh, and of course the challenges in a in a country with uh, with a billion citizens, uh, many who unfortunately uh, have nowhere near the living standards uh, many Western societies have, is is just immense, um, and I think there are really 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 no uh, easy answers, but. People need to have work. <laughs> they need to to see their children educated, and they need to have a hope for the future. So, I mean, if you if you take away some someone's job and or or what they live off in this informal economy, you you certainly need to have a plan. What are you going to replace it with? And and that's a hard job, even in you know industrialized societies. But maybe 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 if you're being optimistic, maybe it's maybe it's easier. Uh, uh, if you can make some shortcuts, and hopefully, um, as the whole world is is, is 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 trying to tackle this problem, maybe maybe some of the mistakes that we have made in our part of the world don't have to be repeated elsewhere. <laughs> Chandra, what do you think? Well, I, I was uh, listening to the discussion happening on Norway. Norway is a country of 5 million people and you have difficulty closing gas and oil wells. How do you expect India to stop coal wells? <laughs> okay, so I think we have to get a grip of the challenge uh, 
that the world faces. I'm not saying it is easy in Norway, but I'm saying it is going to be even far more difficult in India. Okay, and uh, we have to find solutions together. And it should not come across, for example, as you know, that the foundation of climate debate has been equity. And the foundation has been that we will help each other and move ahead. So I think the developed world, why I always, uh, you know, agree with this argument that we shouldn't do the mistake that we have done. And I think we are doing very well on that front. Uh, for example, uh, the energy intensity of economy in India peaked uh, almost 20 years back, okay, at a much lower level of GDP per capita. So we have decarbonized at a much lower level of income than in fact any country in the world. And my hope is that Africa will do the same. In fact, Africa will do even better than India. So first of all, I think it is important for all of us to understand that Developing countries are less carbonized at the current level of income than what developed countries were at this point. So because we have access to technology, we are growing on better technology than what you have. And we need to do even better. So absolutely no argument uh, on the issue that we shouldn't do some of the mistakes. But apart from the mistake, at the end of the day, there's something called as natural resource endowment. Europe has moved to that. Europe closed coal not because uh, you know uh, it wanted to close coal. Coal, coal became unprofitable, and you got gas, natural gas. Okay. India doesn't have access to natural gas, uh, and therefore India is dependent on coal. So India will have to find an alternative to coal. Renewable obviously is becoming a strong contender to replace coal. But as I said. There are 60 million people dependent on informal coal economy, at least 10 times Norway's population. We need to find answer for that. Because technology is not going to make this transition happen. Technology will have an important role. Political decision will play a very important role, and it has to come both nationally and internationally. Tony, you asked for a comment there. Yeah, just very briefly, because I, I appreciate the, the sentiment of uh of um, Chandra's uh, comments, uh, but I think irrespective of the scale of, uh, of the, the challenge we are uh, facing, um, you see some of the same mechanisms when you talk about how do you get this transition. Uh, for our country though, as a small country in terms of population, uh, the oil and gas industry has played an outsized role in our economy. Uh, we will probably, or we will do, uh, we will do uh, great uh, when the day comes that we, we no longer have the revenue. But of course, in order to get there, there is, we need to go through a massive transition of our economy as well in order to get there. Uh, we, we are still very dependent on this, this industry in terms of revenues to the state. A lot of people uh, employed there, and the ripple effects are, are just um, everywhere. So uh, and that in itself is not a, a justification to to keep doing something uh, um, in itself. But it, it's, it's I think that these societal or social transition challenges um, they take on a a, a bit different uh, shape wherever you are, but they're still there uh, and you can see them very clearly in other countries in Europe I think also around the table here was mentioned you know you have coal economies in Eastern Europe as well um, even in the US so um, it's, it's a massive task. Um, when I was talking to earlier Shai, you, um, you kind of the question that you you, you you didn't give an answer to and you said what well, would first India as a developing country closing its coal mines or Norway as a rich industrialized country shutting down its oil and gas production do you have any perspectives on that and I'm asking the entire panel uh, for this actually because as you've been saying this is complex we need alternatives but what comes first everyone is looking at what the other countries are doing and action speaks louder than words so any perspectives on that? Chandra, would you like to start? Well, 
it, it is quite clear to me that at the end of the day, climate change is about how much these countries are going to emit. And uh, I'm not saying that anyone should have right over emission. I think that, that argument is a, a fallacious one. Uh, but it is very clear that the wealthy must help the, the more capable, must help the less capable. Those who can transition first and have the resources to transition first must transition first and help others with technology to transition. So, you know, I, I do not want this argument of you first or I first, but I certainly want a fair distribution of responsibility based on capability to have. If Norway has the capability in terms of, of transitioning quickly, you have resources to do it, then you must make that extra effort. Unfortunately, in global international negotiations, it is becoming almost like a competition rather than a cooperation. And that is very clearly reflected in the last 25 years of uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, how we have all discussed this issue of I will move first or you move first and I will move last. I think that argument is over. But certainly, developed countries must show, must show the leadership because they have more resources to do it. And developing countries must do everything that they can. But as you all know, there are resource crunch. We have growing population. Jobs will have to be provided. Education will have to be given. Uh, and therefore, our capability is low, lower than developed countries. Having said that, it's not an argument that we shouldn't do anything. The argument is we all must do. The more resources you have, the more you must put in transition. So obviously, developed countries, my sense would be that you should take the leadership uh, and move ahead. Great. Anyone who would like to comment or should I just move on? Yes, Edgar and Julie, go ahead. Edgar first. Ah, I think you're muted, Edgar. So just give us a couple of seconds. Are you unmuting yourself there? Ah, nope. <laughs> okay, now thank you for unmuting me. Um, I just want to point out that according to the IPCC, uh, there we have the problem of unburnable carbon, that there is a substantial portion of the current fossil fuel reserves that we cannot produce uh, without going over the two degree threshold. Um, and that's the reserves that we already know. Uh, so trying to find more oil and gas just means that we increase the bubble of uh, of resources that we can't use it it has no value the oil we find of course uh, for norway it has the argument that the oil that it produces is cleaner than from many other sources and and these floating wind power plants can be a further contribution to that um, but i don't think in the end it's it's so much about the co2 emissions per ton per barrel oil produced. It is also about uh, what Chandra points out, the income that is associated with this oil or the remaining uh, carbon that can be burned and how that should be distributed across the world. And I think what he's saying that maybe we should give the Indians uh, a little bit of right to the space in the atmosphere that uh, that we have in, in the past polluted, right? Um, and so how will how can we fairly allocate the benefits uh, of burning oil and gas and coal uh, over the future and, and, and of producing that fuel. And I think that's really a question that we haven't faced yet. And, and Norway is really ducking the bullet here and, and, and not facing up to its international responsibilities. Oh, yeah. I, I know that you need <laughs> Short comment, uh, and I, I guess that Chandra is probably nodding as well when listening to Edgar. But um, I yeah, well, I, let I, him. I, 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 once again, I appreciate sorry, the, the. I'm sorry. Yeah, I appreciate the sentiment of uh, what uh, Edgar is saying, and uh, but I also think that um, he appreciates uh, just as well as I do that uh, the world isn't an ideal place, and Chandra touched upon it also how how international uh, climate negotiations, unfortunately, in, uh, hasn't always lived up to 
to what they should have been. And there's there's probably a reason why the the Paris uh, Agreement places so much emphasis on on the responsibility that each state has. So I'm not going to run the whole argument of, of the benefits of Norwegian oil and gas production compared to to other countries, uh, but um, I think it would be a mistake, uh, not good for our country and not good for the energy markets if we were to make a unilateral decision to uh, reduce uh, our production. Uh, having said that, the geology will take care of this because uh, these resources are finite and uh, we are probably uh, well above the peak already in terms of our oil production, so um, the future will look very different for this industry than the past has. Um, so uh, yeah, I will leave it at that. Uh, Chandra, would you like to just give a short, short comment, and then Julie had something, and we also have two experts that we would like to introduce to the panel. <laughs> I just want to say that uh, there cannot be any fair distribution of carbon budget. We are long past it now. Okay, developed countries have misappropriated most of the budget. So even if you do the best budget allocation of stopping developed countries' emission to zero today, developing countries are not going to get the right of carbon space. So I think let's be very clear on that. And, and I don't want to take that argument further. I think apart, we have to, apart from the, I don't want to talk about right to emission. I think more than that, I think we have to talk about how do we make the carbon pie insignificant. Therefore, there will be a lot more collaboration required. Um, no one is asking for unilateral action from Norway. I think that would be, uh, 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 is not something that is required. Every country will have to come together. And that's where I think Paris Agreement is failing because it is, it is asking every state to do whatever they want. And uh, we have to rethink Paris if, if we really want to meet 1.5. Julie, uh, 1.5 was not really realistic according to your presentation. More of a two degree target is probable. Um, a short comment or um, input uh, from, uh, from you? Oh, no, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's, that's what we're saying. But I, I just want to say, you know, climate policy, re reaching either both 2.5 or 1. Uh, but 1.5 and 2 will require like a massive change in so many areas and so many sectors and you are likely to face resistance in all those sectors you know from every little measure it's likely to face resistance and that sort of requires a very coordinated state you know a sound ministry of finance a sound ministry of energy like we like we have but also obviously international cooperation in order to deal with the sort of multiple arenas of resistance and then I would just like to say <clears throat> I, I don't think neither in Norway or any country that we can manage this without showing that there's a lucrative alternative you know we cannot manage this transition without showing that there are value creation other where else you know <laughs> and that there's something in it for the for each person and individual which is why I think sort of the market trends are drastically helping us and we should just appreciate that and not hinder it. Uh, and that also means, um, I think when it comes to just transition, I mean, first of all, we need to sort of show green value creation in sort of hydrogen batteries, global renewable players and, and so on. But it also means that just transition, we have to compensate, you know, the people who's really suffering from the transition. and to some extent we also have to compensate the people who has the power to stop the transition <laughs> and that's kind of a difficult task for the politician i mean which i have not an answer to how to do it but you know there are forces probably let's take india you know people even if coal is not commercial anymore there are sort of very powerful alliances who can stop the transition because they depend on coal and there somehow have to be an alternative for those alliances in order for the transition to 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 go on and I would just would like to say that I think the European Union's sort of grip on just transition in trying to steer the money over to sort of the coal heavy regions in Poland is probably something of the best cases we have seen of a structural approach to just transition. Okay, that's obviously no much. opinion on oil. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so thank you. Um, I know that the, the, the four of you could probably discuss this further on just by ourselves, but we have, as I mentioned earlier, two specialists as well with us today. And this time, actually, we have two NTNU brains, as I would like to call them. So we see one of them here, Johan Einer Husta, who is the director at NTNU Energy. And also, now you can enter the stage, Anamia Vikmans. Put your camera on, there you are. She is Professor and Head of NTNU Smart Sustainable Cities. And in June, Anamia was awarded the title Mission Innovation Champion 2020 for her long and outstanding work in promoting smart and sustainable cities through research, innovation and education. Now, Chandra, you fell out of uh, the image. You can just come back in again if you want to, put your camera on. Uh, and after listening to the speakers and their discussion so far, Anamia, I would like to start with you. What kind of questions would you like to ask them? I've seen that you've been active on Slido already, so maybe you'd like to repeat one of those questions or you have something else you would like to interrogate them about. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I think I can make a summary of the different comments I, I wrote on Slido. Um, and it links quite a lot to what uh, Julia said last, uh, so the green value creation. We need to be able to offer um, a viable, attractive alternative if someone is going to switch. Um, most of the presentations were a lot about technological innovation. Uh, creating more renewables uh, or simply, well, exchanging fossil fuel-based appliances with renewable-based appliances, um, which is good, of course, but m my concern is, you know, I work with cities, communities. How do we get the increased renewables then firmly embedded in those local communities and those cities? Uh, as was also mentioned, you know, a lot of the cities already exist, cities and communities, we're not going to knock down the existing built environment and, and create something new. Um, so we have to work with what is there. And we have to be able to work with the local environment, both in, uh, in, in slum areas, we need to be work, able to work in Norwegian wooden heritage areas, you know. So we need to really be able to work with the local context and local communities. Um, so the, the question there was, you know, within all the presentations, um, how, how do you work with this kind of, of, of social innovation? So not just the technological innovation, um, political innovation moves in, in that direction, uh, but then social innovation. So creating more active roles for local um, stakeholders, be it citizens or local shopkeepers, uh, e-rickshaw drivers. So how do you get them active in that transition to more renewables um, so that they actually have a stake uh, in and, and can create a different role and a different future for themselves. That's a question oh, to everyone, like basically. To, to address that question <laughs> too, is it to Edgar first of all or to Shamba? Well, if I, we, we could start with Edgar. So, um, for example, now the European Commission, you know, is aiming to create 100 climate neutral cities in Europe by 2030. That seems in itself an almost impossible task, but it is nowhere near enough to reach the targets that Edgar has talked about. And that would be just in Europe, you know, we're not even talking about anywhere else in the world. Um, so, Edgar, what would be your advice then linking, you know, climate neutrality, social innovation? Um, what would you give as advice then to cities and communities uh, to be able to uh, reach those um, emission targets in a better way and faster? Yeah, th thank you. So, so I, I think that uh, the first aspect is that they shouldn't stand in the way. Um, and, um, uh, you know, looking uh, this, this morning how California is burning, and 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 all the uh, suburbs uh, and exurbs that are built into the wilderness, where houses now need to be evacuated, are basically the results of zoning laws that prevent people from living in cities, uh, because you're not allowed to build a multifamily home there. 
you must live in a single family home in California, right? That's basically the, the local zoning laws. And, and we also looked at, uh, when I was in the US, we looked at the issue of taxes. Taxes are also in fav favor of uh, single home ownership uh, which actually creates these structures. So we need to understand, and we're talking about, you know, the coal miners and the, and the oil workers, but there is a lot of established interest uh, in an economy that uh, consists of uh, producing more pollution. And, and that is something that we really need to address. And of course, the, as Julie said, the political economy may, may um, imply that we have to pay off some of these interests with something, right? Um, and, and so it's not only about what people like emotionally feel, but it's also about what, what their material interests are. Um, and I think that's, that's quite important. I do think that especially those of us who who have gone to university, we sort of understand that that uh, process of going through an education in the city actually shapes you. And a lot of, I, I mean, in Europe, it's more of a problem that people don't want to go back uh, to smaller towns, to the countryside, to become doctors and nurses and teachers there. Um, people actually want to live in cities, right? And 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 I think that they actually like a lifestyle and they are environmentally conscious. It's just so hard to live that way. And to, and I think that just enabling and not standing in the way are, are key contributors. And the other factor that I see as really being important is that uh, right now we are very much influenced by advertisements. Um, and a lot of the appeals to our values and emotions are actually by companies who want to sell you something. And uh, organizations that want to convince you, like um, churches, environmental groups, political parties, um, are not as convincing. And they don't have the same appeal as these advertisements, uh, which uh, of course have a, a multi-million uh, dollar industry behind them of, of trying to think of clever ideas of how to appeal to to emotions um, of the of the of the population. So we are basically set up with a system uh, which is very much steered by by the moneyed interests um, that that are in these established industries. So. That's what I see as a main barrier. Anamia, are you satisfied with that question or would you like uh, someone else in the panel to explore it a bit as well? Well, um, I, I think it was a good answer. I, of course, the answer ideally would be something else <laughs> or we have to do something about that. Um, I, I would like to hear from uh, Chandra because we, we've just uh, created a, a new cooperation now with, with India um, where we are looking at the creation of local energy communities. So how if, if you integrate local renewables, uh, that could be a, a few solar panels, it could be uh, hydro-based, it could be something else, a small turbine or so, uh, into a local community, um, how can this benefit the local communities as best as possible? Um, both in terms of energy costs, uh, access to clean energy, uh, clean air, clean water, etc. Um, and we saw that there, even then between Trondheim and Irish cities and Indian cities, there were some joint interests. Uh, so I, I was wondering if you have any experience with this and if, if you have any advice of, of um, could, could working with the local communities be um, one way of addressing um, a just transition? Well, of course, I, I think uh, community-based actions are going to be very, very important. But I just want uh, and the caution here. See, energy services, like any other services, are aspirational. So you can start with this one solar panel to a economically uh, you know, weaker household. But as they get more income, their aspirations in that one. One of the fundamental mistakes we have done uh, in the last few years on community-based engagement is we assume that a poor will be satisfied with one panel. That's not true. Because that person is not going to remain poor. You provide them with basic energy, their income level increases, their aspiration increases, 
they want even better energy service. So I think ambition will have to be built in community initiative. You don't want uh, an initiative, a community initiative, which is for poor to remain poor. I think that's a mistake a uh, lot of uh, uh, collaborations have made in the past. So you must build aspiration and ambition in community action because people will improve on the economic ladder and their aspirations will go up. Uh, if you do that, that is going to be a much more sustainable way of community engagement uh, than the previous models. Thank you for that, Chandra. And I, I can see that Anamia is, is making notes, so she's probably taking that input with her. Uh, now we have a second specialist, and he's been maybe the most patient of them all today, uh, waiting for quite some time to, to, to get his voice heard. Johan Husta, uh, you are, or he is, heading the uh, NTNU Energy, and he knows the Energy Transition Initiative well. And I know that you are also hosting Tony Tiller's visit to Trondheim today. That's why we're seeing uh, you and Tony and Oscar Thomas, the director of the initiative, together in the same room. Now, you've been waiting, so I know that you probably have a lot of questions to ask or maybe even a comment. We're closing in on uh, one o'clock. So what would you like to say? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll try to put things together in a way. Um... From my perspective, um, uh, I've heard uh, a lot of uh, very good presentations today and also good comments from Anemia. Uh, uh, two things that I think is very important uh, related to energy and materials and then especially renewable energies and materials together that is actually for materials we see shifts now when we go for renewable energies and hydrogen we will see that materials the use of materials will change we will actually exploit new materials and um, in the production of fuel cells uh, solar cells etc etc so uh, you didn't touch into that, Edgar, uh, because you, you concentrated on building materials. But if we are going to use renewable energies to support these uh, buildings, these kind of materials will also be uh, important, uh, more important, let's say so, in, in the future. My other comment or question to Julia, is that uh, renewable energy uh, um, um, needs a lot of area. So there is, as we have seen now, uh, national, uh, there is uh, big constraints about uh, wind power on, on land. Uh, and that will come in other countries as well as those technologies will be exploited even more. Uh, one possibility is to use um, the oceans and also the, the uh, let's say you show this big, uh, big water uh, reservoir in Norway, that could be felt or could be um, uh, put up with the solar cells. Um, and I know from the first studies I saw, only two to three percent of the area of such an um, an uh, um, reservoir would be enough to produce as much as the hydropower from the same. So, have you considered, or Statkraft considered, the use of solar cells in combination with uh, with uh, hydropower? Uh, so that was actually two questions here, one for Edgar and one for Julia. The third <laughs> question to Chandra. <laughs> I'm sorry about all these things, but uh, all the questions at the same time. Um, I know from before that uh, there are quite a lot of millions of, uh, of biofuel uh, stoves in India. So that, uh, of course, in Africa, but in developing countries in general. So um, how to shift 
this uh, is a kind of also not only a technology, but it's also very cultural, how you use things, how people adapt to new technologies and so on. So um, how is this uh, really um, cultural uh, input that is needed to, to change the use of, uh, of uh, let's say, biomass, as you mentioned, uh, or stoves? It also has uh, the health, um, you know, from the biostoves, there is a big, a lot of, um, of environmental problems. So that uh, shifting that to a clean energy would also help the health very, very much. So that okay. was my three questions or comments. Yeah. So we take them in the order that you ask them, and I can see that we have uh, reached one o'clock. But I would like to give these three answers a chance. So uh, if we uh, ask all three of you to be very short and precise, so we'll start with Edgar, then Julie, and finish off by Chandra, and I'll just make some conclusive remarks in the end. So, Edgar. Go ahead. What about the yes, material? Yes, thank you, Johan, for the good question. Of, of course, uh, what we do in our modeling is that we assume that the electricity supply is being increasingly decarbonized and that the materials that are produced primarily with electricity, such as uh, aluminium, uh, will become more environmentally friendly uh, compared to uh, materials that require carbon as a reduction material. Uh, and of course, a lot of metals require carbon as a reductant, and, and so there you, you need the shift um, in, in the process itself. Um, and, and then we have uh, these process uh, emissions from cement, and also there are technologies that, that people are working on, right? Uh, but the emissions reductions are, are sort of on the order of 30% rather than a complete elimination. Um, so we, we have some challenges on the side of materials and I think it is important that we don't forget efficiency. We've been talking a lot about renewables but really efficiency needs to be at least as important as renewables if we look uh, towards the decarbonization because um, as you have said, uh, renewables require a lot of land and Julie pointed out that there are other environmental impacts. And so if we minimize all that, we need to make more out of the units of energy and materials that we produce. Good. And that was a very nice bridge over to Julie and the need for new land uh, or even radical innovations within the renewable uh, energy production. Well, in covering all of Europe's energy demand will require 3%, you know, covered with solar, you know, and that would take all of Europe, just to increase, but it require 1%. I think a lot of the countries, I mean, due to the resistance, I mean, everybody's sort of considering should we move something outshore, but that's not going to solve everything. And we also see Poland, UK lifting restrictions on onshore wind because they, you know, because, so they move away to, to the other friends, so to say. You know, they want it to be easier to be uh, renewable uh, onshore. Um, offshore wind, uh, fixed offshore wind will be surely be competitive uh, or more competitive. And I think uh, also floating is very interesting. You would have to find solutions and compromises there as well, and also regard the costs and, and uh, for society, obviously. Uh, on Norway. You know, we have so far uh, a well-functioning energy market and a surplus, uh, but we do need predictability going further. We have for sure considered solar uh, and floating solar. We're experimenting on that right now in, in uh, Turkey, and, and we have uh, cooperation with uh, Ocean Sun. But what Norway really needs, as you know, is flexibility you know the security the security of supply is not sort of rest on more power right now but on flexibility which hydro power can provide but you know i think what we do need is a predictability as developers for onshore as well as uh, wind as well as hydro power yeah. thank you and chandra last but not least the cultural side of the transition well uh, one that Maybe we have overplayed culture for a long time. As people become rich, for example, as I, my family became uh, middle-income income family, uh, we moved out, moved out of uh, dirty fuel. 
we went to natural gas. So there are certain aspects of culture which is important, but the trend is, as you become wealthy, you move to cleaner fuel. As women become more educated, they demand cleaner fuel. And that's what we have to do. Uh, I think in, in Africa and India, uh, as people become more uh, wealthy, they will move out of dirty food. And therefore, we, we have to start planning for actually electricity as cooking fuel. Because if we are looking at a renewable world, electricity cooking is going to be the cheapest available energy for cooking in our part of the world. So we have to think about electric cooking, but maybe we will, we will have hybrid systems, uh, not just one source of energy uh, going ahead in future. But last word, educate women, make them more capable and dirty fuel will reduce. Thank you so much for that final remark, Chandra. And it is definitely time. We're a bit over time, actually. So it's long overdue for me to say thank you to all the speakers, to the expert panelists. Sorry to having uh, kept you waiting for so long, but thanks again for interesting questions and remarks. And not to forget, thank you also to the audience for participating. You've been asking great questions, and I know that NTNU, the, um, the Energy Transition Initiative, will um, save the questions and have a look at them later on, because they are all good uh, input for different kinds of discussions. And I have to admit, for myself personally, I'm really looking forward to the day where we can meet again physically and continue these discussions one-on-one -on -one or even in larger groups. So I'm really looking forward to that. But this was a very interesting webinar. Thank you so much for joining. And um, the next and the last webinar in this series remains. That is taking place on Tuesday, the 29th of September. The topic will be this time as we've already touched upon actually in the panel today, radical social and technological innovation. Now the webinar will focus on opportunities, innovation processes and social and technological solutions that could be part of our energy future. You may already register for that webinar, but for now, thank you once again for participating here today. Stay safe, see you again on the 29th. Bye bye for now. <laughs>